Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Talking Shakespeare, that show in which you have questions about Shakespeare and his plays, and we get you theater professionals to get you the answers. Today, <laughs> I am joined with Kelly Minglecook and Polly Ryapel. Hey. I'm sorry, Paul Ryapel. Polly's good. We're going to call him Polly. <laughs> We're going to call him Polly. And they're going to help us out with the question of the day. Now, the rules of the episode are really simple. Each of us are allowed to swear all we want during the episode, but we can only swear with an assigned Shakespearean insult word. Another feature of this episode is the alarm within phrase. If either one of these people say it, this will happen. Oh. Yeah. So now on to our question of the day. <laughs> question of the day is about a Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, Kelly and Polly and myself, we have all we've been in Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> so many times. So many times. Yeah. How many times? Uh, six for me. Six times. Yeah. I think it's five, maybe six for me. I'm just a three. You're just a three? I've got some time. You played Oberon, Oberon. twice, okay. Lysander twice, oh, wow. uh, and uh, a Snug the Joiner. Okay. I've played Bottom and Oberon and Theseus. And, and I've played Titania, Puck, and Fermia. So we've got some experience here. You talk to almost any Shakespearean actor, they're going to have some Midsummer Night Stream experience. <laughs> <laughs> the question of the day comes from Helen Ellsworth from Sharonville, Ohio. And the question is this In a Midsummer Night Stream, there are fairies. There are yes. a whole lot of fairies. You've got Titania, the queen of the fairies. You've got mm -hmm. Oberon, the king of the fairies. You've got Puck. You've got uh, mustard, mustard seed, seed peas blossom. cobweb, you name. There's a whole bunch of fairies in a Midsummer Night's Dream. What are fairies? Specifically, what are Shakespeare's fairies? Okay, are they the fairies that we think of today, or or were they? What are different? the fairies we think of today? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the little There's, itty bitty yeah. tiny little fairies with the wings and stuff. I think it's a great question because it also determines how it's usually how fairies are usually portrayed in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it, it probably helps when you're reading the play how you envision these things. This just came to me. It's an interesting thought because we're actors doing A Midsummer Night's Dream. We are human sized fairies. But wouldn't it be amazing for a movie to have all of the fairies be little and still do all the mischief and powerful stuff they do? So it's like a petty god war, but they're miniature <laughs> the in the human size. world messing with the humans. It'd be awesome. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth, that's a Victorian concept of the mm -hmm. fairy. It's yeah. A, of a very, very small individual with wings. The word fairy actually mm -hmm. is derived back to fae. Fae being enchanted, meaning enchanted. It was an enchanted woman. An enchanted woman. Yes. Morgan Le Fay actually Morgan means yes. Morgan the Enchanted. Fairy actually is a description of the locale where the fae lived. It's also talking about it being like an action like... Like, um, thievery, thievery, thievery. so yeah, now you're neighbory. doing yeah. fairy, yeah, exactly. Which, yeah, it's so cool. And then, it sort of, it got adopted as, as fairy being the actual being itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about how funny language is that way, like, uh, like the word reverend. Reverend started out as, a, as an adjective, right? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but mm -hmm. now we've used it in conjunction with the actual pastor so often. That it's actually become the title. It's actually become the title. So what were these creatures known as the Fae? I think Shakespeare is setting up, because in his day, there, there was this idea that there are some evil intending fairies, some mm -hmm. malicious fairies, and also good fairies that uh, use their powers to play tricks on people, but not to be harmful or malevolent in right. any way. Shakespeare, I think his text uh, early on when he's talking to the other fairy and the fairy says, aren't you the guy that turns into a three-legged mm -hmm. stool and pretends to be a horse? And Puck says, yeah, I am that merry wanderer, you know, and I think Shakespeare is setting up that he's not the evil type of fairy. He's a trickster. That, that right. he's a trickster. And I think at the end of Puck's monologue, he says, everybody puts their hands on their hips and they laugh. Uh -huh. And I think Shakespeare's really setting out to say, these aren't the evil fairies. These are the good you know. Sure, and I, I did a little studying, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, I'm sure, but the Scottish actually had yeah. a term for uh, good versus mm -hmm. bad, seely and unseely. Seely being, as they described it, works towards the beneficent side of mankind, although in parentheses it said, although they're still quite dangerous. <laughs> and the unseely were the actual ones you needed to be aware of. Hobgoblin is a term for a bad fairy, which is interesting. Puck says, some call me Hobgoblin, some mm -hmm. Puck. 
Interesting. Yeah. I think he's got two sides. As you go through the play, he's obviously doing mischief for his lord, Oberon. Sometimes he's doing mischief because he hates that guy who's been hurting that girl. Sometimes right. he does his own thing, mm. and sometimes he does Oberon's. Neil Gaiman's version of Puck and Oberon and Titania and Sandman is awesome. awesome Puck is an evil, evil mischief maker. If this were Dungeons and Dragons, he'd be definitely chaotic. Yeah. So I think I see your side of it, but I could also see someone going, let's make this a Halloween show sure, sure. and turn him into the merry wanderer of the night, you know? So you can go any which way you want with these guys uh, as long as you follow the rules of the text. What's interesting to me is, however, that the the creatures that we refer to as the fae or the fairies, how they have completely changed. I mean, when Shakespeare performed this, you're talking about creatures that most people were like... (laughs) You know, you know, uh, throwing sure. salt over the shoulder. Mm-hmm. These were spirits you didn't want to screw around with. They were rats, baby. And that, as this as this production has gone through the years, and the Victorians came along, and suddenly the fairies completely became like little sprites and everything, mm-hmm. and ugh, Peter Pan and so forth. That it wound up becoming suddenly the fairies are all benevolent, know, very benevolent mm-hmm. and light and frilly. Well, let's talk about the dangerous part of these beings. There is something bad going on when we first see them. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Titania yeah. and Oberon are quarreling mm-hmm. over a changeling child. That in and of itself the fact is that kind fairies of fairies take babies <laughs> and replace them with fairy children. But they're fighting over a changeling child, and in their fights, Titania has this large speech about how their fighting is affecting the weather. Mm-hmm. And in very bad ways. You've actually said that speech. Mother Nature is erupting violently in response to our feud because nothing is right when we are feuding. We, I'm going back to being the character, right. but um, the fairies obviously have some kind of energy, be it their, interestingly, their emotions that project their power. I don't know if it's a, a, just an Elizabethan concept, but spirits were connected to the elements. Yes, uh, you right. know, to the air, yeah. to the fire, to water, and earth. Yeah. And uh, we see it in another play with the Tempest. We see Ariel is able to take the forms of all of the different elements. Which makes sense why we're upset. It becomes earth vexed. Yeah, very becomes, nicely done, yeah. earth vexed. It was just laid out for me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no one answer for this. It's like when we're talking right now, it's like I keep thinking of different justifications for how to use the text because you really can bend it any way you want as long as you invest in the belief of power behind what you choose it to be. When you guys played Oberon and Titania, what were your powers? How did you enact your powers? The power of song and dance. It was, it was. (laughs) Uh, uh, Jeremy, who directed the show, he made a a very conscious choice uh, in that production to create the magic of that forest mm-hmm. out of music. And the fairy's kingdom was a jazz club in the in middle the of the forest. Yeah. Not, all of the spells and so forth came out of uh, the music. It's just an, one of uh, an infinite number of choices of, of how you can create the magic uh, in, in this world. Right. I saw a production where they, the fairy's powers were very anime-esque. Uh, so there was all this sort of like pounding into the ground, and you know, That's I mean, fun. it was a great idea. When I directed the play, I went with sort of the Galadriel esque Titania, female driven society, where Oberon was sort of the consort and not necessarily the king. Interesting. Um, and so she didn't have to do much to create her magic. If anything, it was just sort of like a wave of the hand or a wave of the finger, yeah. but he had to do like all this uh-huh. sort of like <laughs> things to make things happen, That's you cool. know. So there is a lot of different ways you can play the two leaders. And then you go back to, to Puck, and I've seen multiple versions of Puck. Most of the time, he tends to be very sort of playful and light and so forth. But there have been a couple of ones where like, He's slightly sociopathic, and uh, yeah. I don't know if I'd leave him with any children. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. If you were to do your own version mm-hmm. of A Midsummer Night's Dream, what would be your fantasy fairies? Well, I'll go back to my miniature fairies. <laughs> so you would like to have the Victorians. I Why not? Wouldn't that be fascinating to have humans be so messed around with and so little power of their own for these tiny but godlike huge force kind of things where you could see little fairies tossing like an ocean you know but wouldn't that be fun so mine would be on film i'm also kind of interested in how the whole waking up and seeing uh bottom is an ass <laughs> it would play Ooh, out <laughs> they because, would have I mean, to there's miniaturize like this tiny bit of light the yeah, magic would naked. miniaturize bottom ah oh. so it's a miniature donkey which freaks peter quince and the gang uh, out okay so he'd have wings too then 
Oh, he must. Or Mustard Seed and Peas Blossom, like, pick him up, or her magic oh, can pick him up. Oh, okay. I can do this. Yeah, that's tough. That's actually You can great. try anything to knock this down, and it's going <laughs> to <Yeah>. stand up. <laughs> this is good. How about you? What would your... Uh... I, I actually, I, I have a fantasy midsummer in my head I want to direct one day, and I want to make Oberon, Jim Morrison, and Tanya... Janis Joplin and all of the fairies would be hippies, uh, hippies, yeah. sort of like a Woodstock. Yeah, just kind of yeah, band. yeah, would okay. be kind of hippie musicians, and again, the the magic would kind of come out of the the, the music. So, who would be your puck? Probably Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> the more we talk about what would you like your fairies to be, Shakespeare writes his fairies from his human perspective, and that's something that you know in the legends of fairies. Sometimes it's like they are non-human; they are something else. But I don't think there's any denying, based on the heart of what Shakespeare writes, that there are human emotions and human pettinesses in these creatures. It's so interesting. I just saw the Globe live version of Midsummer mm-hmm. that just came out this last season, and it was fantastic. But one thing that I saw in that, speaking of the human emotion of the fairies, that never dawned on me so clearly before was she has all of these fairies on her team. Oberon has one, one has right. Puck. Right. So it's so it's clearly that she's in power and it's in this production that I just saw, Oberon was just downtrodden, perhaps drunk. Clearly they've had like a sticky breakup or something and he's not taking it well and she's taking it so well. She only flips into madness when she's put under that spell. And then she becomes a crazy lady. I've never seen a Titania so maniacally in love because of that drug. And it makes me want to do it again. So I can be like, oh, I get it now. I get it. (laughs) And then then Oberon has to watch her fall in love with another man, which is even more heartbreaking. Oh, wow. So his own revenge turns against him. Yes. It was just, he broke my heart and she woke me up. But what was successful about that story was how much they relied on the need for human emotion to make them real. Mm. So they weren't going for the big fairy thing. They were going for the what's the driving reason thing. And it was amazing. I'm going to move on now to a fun little exercise, something you can do in your classroom if you happen to be watching from there. There are many fairies in A Midsummer Night's Dream. We talked about them at the very beginning. Cobweb, Mustard Seed. You got Oberon, Titania, Puck. You got the second fairy, Peas Blossom. So... What we're going to do is create our own fairy and what their known little power would be. I'll start you go here. First. You okay. Toe nipper. <laughs> <laughs> Toe nipper is the fairy that, that pulls the blanket up on the bed every night. Yes. To expose your feet to the cold. Oh, oh I like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sort of in Puck's, Puck's side in of Puck's, the whole thing. Puck's world. Yeah. Oh. Okay. What about. Shape shifter, and you would just move everything over just a little bit and slowly <laughs> drive people crazy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just shifting it. That's or we could call her Shifty Winks. Shifty Winks. Shifty I kind of like that. Yeah. I kind of like yeah. that. Yeah, Shifty Winks. Oh, man. Okay. I'm on the spot here. Uh, Come on, Rester. How about Loonster? Oh, Loonster. Loonster. Yeah. Okay. Loonster uh, would. Uh, <laughs> Loonster can bake a really good pie. <laughs> Loonster makes. Bakes great pies. That's his superpower. <laughs> Loonster, the pie baking fairy. <laughs> that wraps up our episode for today. Oh, Nobody really said crazy. the alarm within phrase for six episodes running. Ooh. And that phrase was are you ready? Ready. Tinkerbell. Oh. 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 I even tried to lead you to it. I tried to slide you in there. You did say Peter Pan. And nobody said, you You got close. You, I did. You, you, I did you, it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but you didn't say it. So that wraps up another Talking Shakespeare for today. Remember, if you've got a question about Shakespeare, please leave a comment in the comment section of this video. Also, we'd love to hear from you. What would be your particular fairy for a Midsummer Night's Dream? And what would their power be? And so until next time, thanks, thanks, and ever thanks for stopping on by. The rest is silence. Take care. Yeah, I'm probably Bob Dylan. <laughs> yes. Probably Bob Dylan. Kids, there was these uh, these things back in the old days called Woodstocks. Well, it's just Woodstock. There were two Woodstocks. There actually. were, but that's long ago now, that's too. Long look ago it up. Too. Yeah, look it up. Look yeah. it up. Look it up. Uh, no, actually, I, I kind of like that.